We are going to start our four-week Advent series entitled The Name. <clears throat> the Name. And uh, we are going to in-depth look at the names the prophet Isaiah <clears throat> gave us in Isaiah chapter 9. When he said, for to us a son is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, 1 through 6 is our passage this morning. We're going to be kind of bouncing around to a few different passages, but this will be our main text for our series in the next four weeks. As probably many of us are aware, God has many names, and I think we can learn lots about our God just by learning about all the different names that God has when we read throughout Scripture. Uh, in case we are looking, in this case though, we are looking at the Son and the names that Isaiah has given to the incarnate Christ. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and read uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, to have it fresh in our memories as we get into the word this morning. It says, But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea. The land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has, shown, has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. <coughs> Excuse me. As they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a, ch a child is born, to us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's go ahead and uh, pray uh, as we open up this morning. <clears throat> Lord, we come before you this morning humbled. Lord, humbled by your word, humbled by your presence. And I pray, God, that you would give us the strength this morning. Uh, to persevere in this world, that you would help us to learn the truths that you would have us to learn through your word this morning. I pray that you would give me the words to say and that it would be your words and not my words that pierce the heart <clears throat> of every individual in this room. Lord, we pray that you be with us this morning. Help us to, t to give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> in her book... Keeping Place, Reflections of the Meaning of Hope, Jean, Jen Pollock Michael reflects on the nature of home in a transient age. In this short excerpt, Michael describes the central longing in both Tolkien and Lewis's fiction books. In their stories of hobbits and orcs, fawns and beavers and Father Christmas, Tolkien and Lewis told the story of home as the scriptures tell it. The world has fallen from its original perfection, but it will one day be restored. The enduring legacy of these stories testify to the resonance of their hope. Humans long for the thaw of winter and the return of a king. They want to go home. Acquainted with the early grief of losing a mother, both Tolkien and Lewis knew the longing for a world in which death and injustice did not triumph. Devout Christians, both men, knew the consolation of that desire in the story of Jesus Christ. Because Christ came down as a man, Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Uh, in our, uh, on our way home, when we, uh, well actually, on our way out to uh, uh, Indiana a couple weeks ago, uh, I like, we listen to audiobooks usually when we travel far distances, and uh, my wife and my sister, my sister came with us, uh, were laughing at me and picking on me because I listened to Mike Pence's new book that just came out, um, uh, his biography or autobiography uh, on his time in the Trump administration. And so I listened to that book on the way out, and they were like, man, you're so boring. 
And, uh, but I learned lots of things that I didn't know before. And so on the way out, I, or on the way back, I said, well, we'll listen to something that you guys want to listen to. And so we listened to the dramatized versions of uh, the C.S. Lewis series. And so uh, the first book we listened to was obviously The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And in that book, um, if you've read that book, probably most of you have, or at least heard the story, um, it's all winter in Narnia. And they, they go in and, and uh, they see the fawn and, and long story short, but Aslan is coming the king. And when the king comes, everything turns back to uh, its original, um, what it was created to be, not winter. Um, everything melted. Um, those who had been frozen uh, thawed out. Uh, and so in, in this time that we're reading here in Isaiah chapter 9, um, that's kind of what was going on here. Uh, there, was, there was time of anguish, there was time of gloom, and there was lots going on that the people did not enjoy. There was, there was pain and suffering. And Isaiah wanted to give them a little bit of, an, uh, a, little bit of a, um, a boost. Um, and so he, he brings this prophecy of this king. And so just like uh, the people of Narnia, when Aslan came back and they were excited and things started to turn, that's about what was going on here in the time of Israel at, in Ch Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah is prophesying about this king to come. And as I said just a second ago, Israel's going through turmoil, Israel's going through pain at this time in their history, and they needed some type of stability, some type of hope. And so Isaiah is tasked with bringing this news of hope, this good news, to the people of Israel. The news that J.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis knew is the news that Isaiah was bringing to the Israelites. The fact that uh, Christ is coming. In our case, Christ has come. And that's a message of hope called the gospel. And so the day in which we live, though, is very similar to the day in which we are reading about here in Isaiah chapter 9. And we're going to look at some passages here in Isaiah and see uh, what's going on in those days and see how we can relate it to what's going on in our life, our, uh, our world today. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 8 says, Their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. Sounds like our world today. We worship things. We worship, we may not bow down to them, though some do, but we worship stuff. We worship material things. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 8 and 9 says, For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen, because their speech and their deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. For, they look on their, or for the look on their face bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Boy, that's going on in our world today, isn't it? They don't even hide their sin anymore. It's out there for the whole world to see. Just like Sodom, they proclaim it. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 24 says, for they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. If that isn't a picture of the world in which we live today, then I don't know what is. For they have rejected the law of the Lord and have despised the word of the Holy One. Sounds very much like what we live in today. It was so bad that people started to think, like many of us do, that there's no hope. The Israelites are in bondage. They were enslaved for 400 years in Egypt. They'd been brought out. They'd been chased. They wandered in the wilderness. And it had come, and you look back and, uh, and earlier in the book of Isaiah, and it says that God hid his face from them because of their sinful, stale hearts. He had pulled out. They were stuck in darkness. And when you're stuck in darkness, it feels like there's no hope. And that's where the Israelites were at. They didn't have any hope. Much of our world today does not have any hope. They place their hope in things. They cry out for anything but what they should be crying out for. Because they have no idea what to cry out for. 
And after describing in detail uh, in the previous few chapters how broken these people are, Isaiah begins to provide them with hope. And that's my prayer as we go over the next few weeks. And that's always a, a, an exciting time at Christmas time because it is a time of hope. Because the message of Jesus Christ, the message of the Son coming, brings hope. And so my desire over this next four weeks is to bring hope. And if you haven't uh, ever brought somebody to church, you haven't ever invited anybody to church, the next four weeks are probably a very uh, good time to do so. Um, because the gospel, not in the gospel is at least talked about every week, should be. But the gospel is going to be laid out in every one of these four sermons. Because you can't talk about the sun coming and the good news of hope unless except with the gospel. And so Isaiah begins in chapter 9 to speak of this coming king, this hope that is going to bring peace to the world that is lost. And he's going to do so because of who he is, not necessarily what he, go, what he is going to do. He will do lots of things, and ultimately it's about what he did with his life, but it's about who he is. He's going to bring peace. Isaiah gives this coming king multiple different names. And each of those different names describes the incarnate Christ perfectly. In its highest use, a name sums up character. <coughs> Not many people today do so. Um, but back in the biblical times, many names that were given to people usually represented uh, something. There was a meaning to it. And so each of these four names that Isaiah lays out and gives Christ means something. And it talks about his character. It declares the person, it, it declares the person that which he is. The next few weeks we're going to encounter who this king is in more detail based on these names that Isaiah gives us here. But in order to be able to fully understand and make sense of the depth of the prophecy of Isaiah here in this chapter, we must look at the incarnate Christ in the New Testament. And so the next four weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to look at each of these names that Isaiah has given Jesus Christ. And then we're going to go to the New Testament and we're going to see how it played itself out in the character of the actual Jesus uh, of Nazareth. And the Savior of the world is given four names by the prophet Isaiah, and these names represent who the incarnate Christ is. And it will be how people will know that he truly is the prophesied Christ. And so the first name we're going to look at this week uh, is Wonderful Counselor. And so the perfection of this coming king is found in his qualification for ruling. What qualifies him to rule? Well, it's the fact that he's a wonderful counselor. It literally means a wonder of a counselor. Wonder in Hebrew has multiple different meanings, but the meaning in the word that is used here is to separate or to distinguish. And so Jesus is, separates himself above all other counselors. Now, all kings had counselors back in those days. They would have men, a group of men that would surround them, that would help them make decisions, that would speak into their ear, give them uh, some type of information maybe that they didn't know or to just give them a piece of wisdom, truth, maybe that they already knew but to help them solidify the decisions they're about to make. Our president does that. Uh, in America today, he surrounds himself with advisors that help him make decisions. And so, uh, but Jesus didn't do that. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. He didn't need advisors. Even scripture uh, says uh, in, in Proverbs 15, 22, there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors, yet Christ didn't need to have counselors. He was the one that gave the counsel. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 13 and 14 says, Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and, whom, or, and who made him understand? Basically saying, who gave the Lord counsel? Nobody. He is the wonderful counselor. Luke chapter 2, 
verse 46 and 47 says, After three days they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Or sorry, yeah, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Because he is the wonderful counselor. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 2 speaks to Christ, saying, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. Part of the reason why the nation of Israel was in the situation they were at this moment was because, uh, or why we are as a nation are in the same boat, is because of uh, in Psalm chapter 78, uh, verses 9 through 20, for sake of time, we won't read that entire chapter, but basically sums it up as they forgot the wonders of God. Wonders found their definition not just in the activities of God, but in the very nature of God. And so the people of Israel had forgotten what God had done. They had forgotten that who God was. America has gotten to that point. We've forgotten who God was. I had a conversation with one of my family members while I was on th or at, uh, at Thanksgiving. We were talking about uh, our world and where it's at. And uh, as much as you don't like to talk politics at Thanksgiving, <laughs> uh, naturally goes that direction, I guess. But we were talking, and one of the things that we were talking about was he, he, he posed the question, why, why is our world the way it is, or something along those lines. And my answer to him was, because we as parents have forgotten to teach our children. We just talked about it this morning in Sunday school. We don't, tell our, we don't teach our children about the Lord. For years and generations, we've left our kids to search for themselves. We ourselves have forgotten the wonders of God. We ourselves have forgotten who God is. And because we aren't enamored with God anymore, we don't, dis we don't pass that on to the next generation. And Israel had gotten to that point. We have gotten to that point. We become like the gods we worship. So if our God is an artificial substitute, we will become artificial too. The very senses that ought to bring us to thrill with wonder become jaded and paralyzed and then dead. We don't worship the true God anymore in our world. We worship lots of other things. And so therefore... That's become what we are today. And that's where Israel was at. And Isaiah knew that they needed to hear lots about this coming king that was going to bring them hope and peace. We're going to hear lots about the incarnation of Christ this Christmas season. That's always what we hear. But we must read the incarnation with a knowledge of the Old Testament prophecy. Isaiah describes him as the wonderful counselor. Well, what we are going to do this morning is we are going to look at the incarnate Christ in the New Testament and see how this prophecy revealed itself in the character of the incarnate Christ. A wonderful counselor is someone that does three things. <clears throat> he, he, she deals personally with us. Prope properly diagnoses us and powerfully delivers us. So we're going to look at what Scripture says this morning and how it backs those three things up when speaking to the incarnate Christ. And so Christ is the ultimate wonderful counselor. It plays itself out in these three things. The first thing is he deals with us personally. <clears throat> Sorry, my, my throat's killing me this morning, but we're going to move forward. <clears throat> he deals with us personally. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. You can go ahead and turn there. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. We're going to see Jesus displayed as the wonderful counselor in this story. Most of us have heard the story of uh, this woman caught in adultery. And so all of the, uh, the Pharisees 
who have caught her in the act, bring her in front of Jesus. And it says, they went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst of, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now when the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women, what do you say? This they said to test him, that he might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down, wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued they looked, or to ask him, he stood up and said, Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. At once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with a woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. A good counselor deals with his patients, or his uh, people in which he's counseling, deals with them personally. He doesn't pawn off the hard things on his, his, uh, his second in command. He doesn't, send one out, and he doesn't send someone else in to gather all the details like a doctor does with his nurses. And he doesn't do all of this in front of others. He deals with the, the people personally. Jesus deals with this woman who had been caught in sin personally. She's brought before Jesus and he deals with her personally by telling off the Pharisees. He says to them, he who is out without sin and cast the first stone. And then he starts to bend down and he starts to write in the sand. And uh, there's lots of debate as to what Jesus wrote in the sand or why he was writing in the sand. Um, my, my belief is that Jesus was just buying time for them before they left so that he could deal with the situation. I think Jesus was writing in the sand, hoping that they would just leave because he wasn't responding. And then when they kept pushing him, he finally stood up and said, all right, well, he was without sin, cast the first stone, knowing, obviously, that none of them are without sin. And so they got all flustered, and they left. And that was the point. I believe Jesus, the point was, Jesus was trying to get them to just leave so that he could deal with the woman personally, on her level. Not in front of everybody, but with her, just her. And they do so. He could have just allowed her to be stoned. He didn't. He could have told his disciples to handle this. I got better things to do. He didn't. He addresses the situation in a personal way. He wanted the woman to know that even though she had done wrong, she was going to get the full attention of the wonderful counselor. Jesus dealt with the sin of the woman caught in adultery. He didn't pass it on to others. He didn't allow it to, it to happen in front of those condemning her. He dealt with her as only a wonderful counselor does. He did so personally. Not only does he deal with us personally, but he diagnoses us properly. Diagnoses us properly. A good counselor diagnoses those he's working with. He gives them a reason for the pain that they're enduring. The reason why the Pharisees were not in lockstep with Jesus uh, in this situation and they were constantly getting frustrated with him was because they were living a life of hypocrisy, which Jesus points to. Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 15. So we're going to bounce a lot, around a lot. We're going to see some different uh, things uh, about Jesus and how he handles certain situations. He dealt with the woman... Uh, in, caught in adultery personally, and then he diagnoses uh, the Pharisees and scribes properly here in Matthew chapter 15. I'm going to read verses 1 through 9. It says, Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles uh, father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father, and father or his mother, what would you have gained for me is given to God. 
he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus diagnoses the problem of the Pharisees. They confront Jesus with their frustration of how his disciples have broken tradition. And Jesus says, the reason why you have this problem, the reason why you have this frustration, is because you're hypocrites yourselves. He confronts that hypocrisy. He refers back to Isaiah's prophecy when he's referring to it. He says, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. He sees the conditions of their heart. He sees that they walk in darkness because they live according to the law and not according to Christ's righteousness. Uh, remember, he speaks to that back in Matthew chapter 5 when he says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so their problem is their hypocrisy. Their problem is that they are walking in darkness rather than walking in the light. Which is the problem with so many people in our world today. Jesus has diagnosed that problem. The reason why we live and have no hope is because we walk in a world filled with darkness. That's the problem that this world has today. The reason why we have no hope. The reason why there's no peace in this world. We're not going to do it by garnering peace deals between America and other countries. We're not going to do so. We're not going to be able to fix the problem with money. I had that conversation with a, a family member uh, over this Thanksgiving also. How you're going to fix the problem is by bringing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how you're going to fix the problem of hopelessness in our world today. That's what fixed the problem for the Israelites. Jesus diagnosed that problem long ago. Long before the, the, the New Testament. He diagnosed that problem way before, way back at the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve took of the fruit and they sinned, Jesus, God diagnosed the problem way back then. It's sin. That's the, the problem that we have today in this world. It's sin. Jesus calls them just as they are, hypocrites. He does not see them children of God. He does not see them as followers of Christ but as children of darkness. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 18 says, They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. Those that walk in darkness will be exposed because the light has come to earth. That's why all of a sudden these Pharisees started getting frustrated and, the, and there started becoming riots and there started becoming all of the things that were happening in Israel at the time was because Jesus came, the light has shone, and now the darkness is being exposed. Jesus came as the light. John chapter 3 verses 19 to 21 says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. That's the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people that love darkness rather than light are going to be exposed. Jesus diagnosed the problem. The problem is sin. And as a result of that diagnosis, he knew we needed to be delivered. He knew there needed to be a solution. Any good counselor knows there needs to be a solution to the problem. Now, there's lots of... Uh, uh, counselors in our world today that think they have all the answers and they think that solutions to the problem is throwing money at it or electing new leadership but it's not the solution is Jesus Christ and that leads us to our final point here this morning 
and that is that he delivers us powerfully. So a wonderful counselor deals with us personally, he diagnoses us properly, and then lastly, he doesn't just leave us to fend ourselves, but he delivers us powerfully. Jesus delivers us from the effect of his diagnosis. The result of the diagnosis, though, is terminal. Yet Christ came and was delivered to the hands of his enemies so that we could be delivered from the hand of our enemy. We talked about that diagnosis being sin. Paul spoke of Christ who gave himself up for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God our Father. And so Jesus came specifically to deliver us. Hebrews chapter 2 Verse 14 to 17 says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those through who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. Follow this last point, to make propitiations for the sins of the people. Jesus delivered us. And so we go back to the, the Israelites in Isaiah chapter 9 and all of that, what they were going through. <laughs> Isaiah knew exactly what they needed exactly what they needed to hear. They needed to hear that there was a wonderful counselor coming and he was going to come and he was going to deal with each of them personally. He was going to come and he was going to diagnose them. And he was going to come and he was going to deliver them. Which is the most important point that we need to know about our Savior is that he delivered us out of sin. He delivered us out of death. How did he do that? I think I'd be uh, fail at my job this morning if I didn't give us that opportunity or share with you what that looks like. Go back to the diagnosis. The diagnosis was sin. And it wasn't just one person, but it was the world. When Adam and Eve sinned and ate of the, the tree back in the garden, that passed down from person to person to person. So sin doesn't just affect Adam and Eve, but it affected all of us. It affected the world in which we live. And so Jesus, or so God, knowing that, gave us a way out. Scripture says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all made mistakes. We've all had problems. We've all sinned. And because of that sin, says Scripture says the wages of sin is death. Now, all of us have sinned, and so all of us are going to die. And not just die physically, but die spiritually. But God made a way that we might live eternally with him. He sent his son Jesus to be the substitute, or as Hebrews chapter 2 stated, the propitiation for our sins. Christ came in the form of a baby, and that name was Jesus. He came and he, he lived a perfect sinless life on this earth so that you and I could have eternal life. But he didn't just come and live a life that was perfect because that wasn't enough. He came and lived that perfect life specifically so that he could come and die on a cross. He was delivered over to the hands of his enemies so that we might be delivered from the hands of our, own, of our enemy which is death. And he died on a cross. He was beaten. But he didn't only die, he rose again, and he conquered sin, and he conquered death so that you and I could have life. And Scripture says that if you believe that, if you admit the fact that you are a sinner and that there is going to be a penalty for that sin and that is death, but then you believe that Jesus Christ truly did come as the wonderful counselor Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, if you believe that, 
and you confess the fact that you are a sinner to the Lord and that you need a Savior, the Bible says that you will have everlasting life. The whole purpose of Jesus' coming was to, yes, bring peace here on earth, but so that it extends into heaven. Jesus Christ came so that you and I could have life everlasting. So I want to give us the opportunity to do that this morning. I'd like everybody to bow their head and close their eyes. And I know I'm not ignorant enough to believe that everybody in this room, the ch chances are everybody in this, somebody in this room has never trusted Christ as their Savior. <coughs> they've never had the opportunity or never been given the opportunity, or maybe they've just wasted the opportunity to trust Christ as their Savior. As I said before, just it, it, there's three things that you need to do in order to be saved. It's admit that you are a sinner. Admit that the wage for that sin is death. And then believe that Jesus came, truly came, on this earth as a baby in the form of man. He lived that a perfect life and then was, was killed as a substitute for our sins. And then he not only died on the cross, but he rose again as the resurrected Lord that conquer, conquering sin and death. Scripture says all you have to do is those three things. Admit, believe, and confess. Confess your sins. Confess that to God this morning. So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Lord, we <clears throat> thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come into your house. Lord, we pray that you would convict the heart of anyone in this room that has never trusted you as Savior. God, you are a wonderful counselor. You deal with us personally. You diagnose us properly. And, Lord, most importantly, you delivered us powerfully. Lord, you delivered us from the grave by rising again from the grave and conquering that sin and death. And, Lord, we give you thanks for that this morning. God, we pray if there's anybody in this room this morning that doesn't know you, that they would cry out to you this morning as, uh, as their Savior, that they would come and they would uh, talk to myself or somebody else in our church that, and just let them know that they, they are in need of a Savior. But God, for the rest of us this morning, I pray that you would help us to be convicted of uh, what we need to change in our hearts. God, there is a world out there that is lost and dying. And Lord, I pray that you would be with us today, that you would help us to have a a new perspective as to how we should be bringing the message of the gospel to those around us. Lord, we are grateful for the hope that you bring in your son. We are thankful that he is a wonderful counselor. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.